Welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church, Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. And uh, we're glad you're joining us this evening. I want to say hello to my Aunt Polly in Michigan, who gave me a very encouraging text. Told me that she's been watching more of the services, or watching the services, uh, since we've started this. And uh, that was a lesson. I'm glad to know that we've got some influence in Michigan. Also, I want to say hello to a couple of families that are listening through the cell phone. Uh, we've got some families that are off the grid, so we've got live cell phones in the church that are hooked up to Don and LaDonna Allen, Dave and Jolene Friesner. I hope you, you all can hear me from the phone there. But it's good to have them with us. Need to mention something. My wife had put together some Easter cards for our church family. And so... For all of you that are members of Lighthouse Baptist Church, you were supposed to get a card. And, uh, Brother Aaron, I don't know if we can zoom in on this or not, but the card on the, on the outside says, He is risen. We want to be a blessing to you since we couldn't have Easter service. But what we discovered was some people got this card, blank. You got a blank. That's a real bummer. And so what we want to know is this, or we want you to know, there was more to the card than the cover. And we would like to get you a card with some stuff on the inside. I know the rest of you got that $100 bill and everything. Well, uh, if, <laughs> if you got a blank card, please call us, text, text us, let us know. We want to make a list and make that right, okay? We, here we try to be a blessing and ended up uh, making a blooper a little bit. Well, uh, I want to go ahead and open up some prayer, get us started here. We're going to have a couple songs. And once again, grab your Bible, if you would, and turn to 2 Kings, if, if you would, 2 Kings chapter, I think we're going to be in 9, actually, 2 Kings 9. At the very beginning of the service, when we start the preaching, we're going to bounce around a little bit in our Bible. I've got to reveal a story. And I want you to understand the story, and from that story, we're going to pull out some great teaching. Uh, so have your Bible with you. That will help us. Brother Brian's going to lead us in a couple songs. But at the end of the sermon, we'll have another song, and then we'll close the evening in prayer. We want to take time to pray for our, some of our elected officials. We've had some call-in prayer requests. And so we want to take time to pray for people, okay? So let me go ahead and pray with you at this time. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful to be able to gather together this way. Uh, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would use this service to be a blessing and an encouragement to everybody who is listening, who is viewing. We pray that their faith would be strengthened and that you would be glorified. Lord Jesus, we're asking for your power upon all that we do tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And let's all sing a shelter in the time of storm in 284.
in 564, he keeps me singing. And we're going to have a, uh, a guest, Brother John Sheets, uh, pray for the offering. But he'll be praying through the phone. So I'll have Brother Brian come up here. And uh, Brother John will pray through the phone, okay? All right, so let me give you these announcements. First of all, I want to say this. Uh, praise the Lord for uh, Carter Verdine, Rick Cox, and Ethel Rose, who have already finished reading through the Bible this year. Now, I knew Carter had been up there, but I was very surprised. I didn't get a chance to, I guess I just didn't recognize that the other two had did it this, by this Sunday. But we want to rejoice with them. And we want to continue to challenge you in your Bible reading. Uh, this is the time to get some Bible reading in, that's for sure. I hope you take advantage of that, okay? Turn the TV off for a while, all right? Uh, also, I want to say thank you to those who have committed to pray on Wednesday night from 6 to 6.30. And that, I appreciate you and Roger committing to do that, as well as the Saturday from 8 to 8.30. And of course, the reason we do that is, one, we need the blessing of God on, on the ministry here, the preaching and teaching of the Word, and that comes through prayer. But two, I also know that people who are praying for the services get more out of the services. So, boy, what a blessing it is to know that you've done that. And I want to mention, uh, Roger Bratcher is in the book of Ezekiel. And Annette is in the book of Job, so they're making good progress as well. And I'd love to hear from other church family, uh, where you're at in your Bible reading, how you're doing, okay? And if you have made that commitment to pray, it means a lot. The very fact that I can share that with other people sometimes encourages other people to get involved. So let me know. At this time, we'll have uh, we'll have Brother John pray for the offering. Hello, Brother John. Are you there? Yes, we're ready when you are. Okay, first of all, I want to say hi to everybody. Len and I miss you all. And thank you for everyone behind the scenes that's making this all come together. So let's go ahead and turn this off. Heavenly Father, I love you. We thank you for all you do. We thank you for all you're about to do. Lord, I thank you for our pastor, Lord, and his wife, and all the people that are doing the work to make this possible. We can watch this from home. And Lord, I just pray that you'd bless him tonight, give him power from all high. Lord, as we take up this offering, I pray that you bless it, be used for your glory, bless the special music in the sun. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just love. 
you're watching, what a blessing. We appreciate that. We're going to have some expectations out of you when you get back here. Brother Fred is 90 years old, and uh, what a man of God. He, he uh, blessed my heart when he decided to become a member of this church. That was an encouragement. All right. First King or Second Kings chapter 9. I'm sorry, 1 Kings. I told you 2 Kings, but 1 Kings chapter 9 is where we're going to begin. 1 Kings. So that will be just a few pages to the left. 1 Kings. And so on Wednesday nights right now, I'm leaving it wide open as I uh, prepare the services. I'm just using my regular Bible reading to draw sermons and uh, trying to be sensitive to the Lord. We typically uh, have a series on a Wednesday night or a Sunday evening, but right now, I'm just, I'm just leaving it wide open. And I believe I've got something that will be a blessing to you. It's helped me. I want you to notice this. If you're able to stand, I think we should still honor uh, the reading of God's Word. If you're able to stand, let's look at 1 Kings chapter 9. And I need to mention this real quick. Solomon is the king of Israel. He has just taken the throne, and he is building or looking to build the temple of God. His father, David, wanted to build this temple, but God would not allow him to do it. God told David, Solomon, your son, will build the temple. And David prepared in numerous ways to help uh, Solomon, uh, at least with the furnishings. But now, Solomon being king, he's ready to go to work. But he needs somebody who is skilled with lumber, who's a, uh, skilled with getting uh, lumber from long distances, and they were looking to build it with cedar. And so, uh, what we find here, we're going to read 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 10. Turn that out. And after he completes his building project, this is what takes place. It says in verse 10, And it came to pass at the end of 20 years, when Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house, now Hiram, the king of Tyre, had furnished Solomon with cedar trees and fir trees and gold according to all his desire, that the king that then... King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. And Hiram came out from Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had given him, and they pleased him not. And he said, What cities are these which thou hast given me, my brother? And he called them the land of Kabul unto this day. We're going to pray. Father, we ask that you speak to our hearts now and Give us understanding of your word. I pray, Lord Jesus, that uh, you'd bless the preaching and teaching of the scripture. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to title this sermon, The Misinterpreted Gift. The Misunderstood Gift might be a better title. The Misunderstood Gift. And what we read here is uh, just a narration of Solomon. Uh, giving what on the surface appears to be a substantial gift to a man who's helped him for nearly 20 years. Now what you need to understand is this. These cities were a gift. They were not a wage. As a matter of fact, if we took time and turn in your Bibles, if you would, to chapter 5, 1 Kings 5. In 1 Kings chapter 5, we'll discover the actual wage that Solomon offered Hiram to do this work in providing the lumber. I want to read this passage. It's Wednesday night, so bear with me as we look at this in 1 Kings 5. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father. For Hiram was ever a lover of David. And Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, Thou knowest how that David, my father, could not build a house unto the name of the Lord his God, for the wars which were about him on every side, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side. 
so that there is neither adversity or adversary nor evil occurring. And behold, I purpose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build an house unto thy name. Now therefore, command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon, and my servants shall be with thy servants, and unto thee will I give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that can skill to hew timber like unto the Sidonians. So we move on. They made an agreement, and we look down at verse 10. So Hiram gave Solomon cedar trees and fir trees according to all his desire. Verse 11. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures of wheat for food to his household and 20 measures of pure oil. Thus gave Solomon to Hiram year by year. Now I want to pause and say this. They made an agreement. There was a wage set for the work and Solomon paid the wage. Hiram got all that he was asking for that he was expecting in regards to the labor that he had divvied out amongst his men. And so when the work is done, when the project is over, Solomon, Solomon, he's not being malicious. Solomon is offering a gift. He wants to be kind. And so, and I, I wonder, go back to chapter 9, I wonder if during these 20 years, Hiram had a chance, and I'm sure he did, had a chance to visit Solomon in the many cities that Solomon had already developed. And he looked at these cities that Solomon had developed, and he looked at all the grandeur of Solomon's empire, and he thought to himself, this is magnificent. And so Solomon, Solomon gives him 20 cities. The only difference is they're not cities that have been developed. In reality, most likely, there are cities that were ancient ruins from the Canaanites when Joshua came in that had never been reconstructed, that had never been repaired. And so Solomon offers these, by the way, Solomon had probably repaired a lot of those cities. And uh, so Solomon offers these 20 cities to Hiram thinking, well, this is great. He'll have the same opportunity I do. But rather than get excited about it, rather than rejoice in it, we find it didn't please him at all. He wasn't grateful at all. And as a matter of fact, if you will turn in your Bible now, I said to 1 Kings 9 that we already read the fact that he was displeased and he called them Kabul. I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 8. 2 Chronicles chapter 8. You need to see this. So, <clears throat> Hiram is not only ungrateful and rejects the gift, but he returns the gift to Solomon. In 2 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, and don't be confused with the difference in spelling, it's the same person. Verse 1 says, And it came to pass at the end of 20 years, wherein Solomon had built the house of the Lord in his own house, that the cities which Hiram, that's Hiram, had restored to Solomon, Solomon built them. The word restored there means returned. Hiram did not restore them or rebuild them. He returned them because the text tells us who built them. All you've got to do is look in your Bible and you can see it says Solomon built them and caused the children of Israel to dwell there. Now, I want to give you three thoughts concerning this story here. First of all, I want us to look at the difference of two perspectives. Then we're going to zero in on the misunderstood gift. And then finally, we're going to look at the redeveloped cities. And so let's just begin here. As we consider the difference between two perspectives, we're talking about two men here. King Hiram of Tyre, or the king of Tyre, and King Solomon, God's anointed man for Israel. Once again, Solomon had given these cities not with not to be ruined. He was grateful. But Hiram went to view those cities, and what cities are these? He says to Solomon. He calls them Kabul. It's interesting. The very fact that he calls them Kabul reveals something. 
The very word means limited or sterile. That's what the word means. He was saying, it's a wasteland. But when Solomon gets them, we find he builds them up and he puts the children of God in there. I mean, the, the children of Israel are in the cities. So you know what's going on there. There's people praising the Lord. The, the shouts of Zion are in these cities. Uh, God is being praised. The true God is being lifted up. He wouldn't have put the children of Israel in, in ruins. But that's what, that's what Hiram saw. Hiram saw ruins. But Solomon saw renovation. Hiram saw a limitation. But Solomon saw uh, possibilities. Hiram saw obstacles. But uh, Solomon saw uh, opportunities. Hiram saw the wasteland, but uh, Solomon saw profit. Uh, Hiram saw loss, but Solomon saw uh, gain. I'm just telling you, these two men had two total different views of the same thing. And there are people right now who are stuck at home. They're not able to go to work. And yet, you need to understand, there's, you can take, there's really two different views you can take of this thing. You can look at this as from God, or you can get mad, and you can get upset, and you can let your spirit be quenched, and uh, it's only going to hurt you. But <clears throat> regardless, on any given occasion, we can, you can bring a group of people to a situation and uh, uh, talk to them and interview them afterward and get a, a number of perspectives, some positive, some negative. But I'm just telling you, when it comes to this wasteland, so-called, by all appearances, it, it looked like desolation. And yet Solomon didn't see it as desolation. Man, he saw commerce. He saw civilization. He saw order coming out of chaos. And yet, that's not what Hiram saw at all. Uh, by the way, you know what affects their thinking? Their view of God, their walk with God. And that's what affects their thinking as well. The way you look at the world, if you're looking at it through spiritual eyes, you can see and rejoice like the Apostle Paul did in a Philippian jail. But if you're looking at it through carnal eyes, you can complain and be disgusted and get upset about everything about life and all of a sudden uh, you're the most critical person in the world. So, two different perspectives. Now, <clears throat> the word built in 2 Chronicles chapter 8 verse 2 when it says that the cities which Hiram had restored to Solomon, Solomon built them. The word built there has to do with repaired or restored. I mean, it can be used in those different renderings. Most likely, because Hiram recognized them as cities, but not cities worth anything, they were cities that were desolate, broken walls, broken buildings. There was all kinds of garbage and debris that needed to be removed. And who knows, the wilderness had probably grown up in the middle of it all. Lots of work. But to Solomon, it was worth the work. It was worth the work. And yet, I want to bring us to point two. The misunderstood gift. Because here's where it's going to get practical. If that wasn't. You know, uh, a sculptor can look at a block of stone and see a statue of Alexander the Great, for that matter. But somebody else can look at it as just a big hunk of stone of rock. And it's really on how you look at life. And yet, <clears throat> here he is. Hiram's done all this work for 20 years. He's been paid. But uh, now he's got this gift. It's a gift. And he's looking at these cities. And there's this question mark. I can see these question marks popping up above his head. And then he out loud says to Solomon after he's looked at all 20 cities, what cities are these, my brother? Like, are you kidding me? You're giving these to me? He 
He didn't get it. He wasn't grateful, that's for sure. He didn't get it. He misunderstood it. I want to take you through the Bible, but I want to take you to real life, and I want you to consider some things. The Bible says every good gift and perfect gift is from above, cometh down from your Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, no shadow of turning. We have an idea of what a gift ought to be. God knows best, and God gives the best gifts. When we think of gifts, we think of anything that makes us feel good, profits us uh, financially, and comfort, and that sort of thing. That's immediate. But when God thinks of gifts, he thinks of gifts often in the more permanent sense, in the more eternal sense. Let's go back in our Bible. And I'm not even going to turn there, but let's go back to the story of Joseph. Joseph is a man favored by his father. He has 11 brothers, but his brothers can't stand him. And his brothers are so upset at him that they're willing to, first of all, some of them are willing to kill him. But they end up selling him into slavery for 17 years. He is a slave, and then, of course, 15 years, he, he's a slave, and two years, he's a prisoner in Egypt. You know the rest of the story, so we can read it, and we don't really feel for Joseph the way we ought to, but according to Psalms 105, he greatly cried, and he, he, was, he was in shackles, and he was, he was hurt. He was physically hurt. Uh, tormented with what he had to go through, let alone being taken away, taken away from his father. For 17 years. I mean, he's, as a slave, he's doing his job in Egypt, and then he's lied about, he's put in prison. But then you know the story. He's called up out of prison to interpret a dream because he helped somebody while he was in prison. Interprets the dream. Pharaoh acknowledges the wisdom of God in his life and puts him as a prime minister. He's, he's number two as far as authority goes in Egypt. From prison to that almost complete power to the, a prince of Egypt. Now let me ask you, <clears throat> if we look at the whole story, we can see that the slavery was a gift. We can see that being thrown in jail was a gift. Now, we wouldn't see it at first, but there was something in Joseph that kept him right with God. And he, no doubt, when all was said and done, when he deals with his brothers after his, father's di after his father dies, he has the right heart attitude. He said, what you did to me, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You know what he was saying? All that was a gift from God. That tough childhood that I had, that hardship that I went through, it was really a gift. And I don't know what your past is like, and I don't know what kind of parents uh, you had as a child. And, uh, I don't know any of that, but I do know this. God knows what's going on in your life. And if you'll look to him and turn to him, you might discover it was all a gift to help you. We can move on in our Bible and lose other characters. Let's go to David. Here David, he's fresh from battle after conquering Goliath. And it's only, it's less than a chapter that we all of a sudden see the jealous eye of his boss wanting to kill him. King Saul is so envious of David, he is attempting to murder David. David had nothing but good to say about Saul, and he prayed for Saul, and, but now he is so hateful toward David, David has to flee the kingdom. He not only has to flee the kingdom, but Saul chases him. Saul looks to hunt him down with some 2,000 men. And for nearly 10 years, ladies and gentlemen, for nearly 10 years, David is on the run. But during those 10 years, you and I read some of the most magnificent psalms, words of comfort, because of David going through the hardships. 
David would even testify that God gave me honey out of the rock. Referring to the sweetness out of a hard place. But what took place there during these 10 years after Saul dies, David would become king of Israel. And all of that was a learning experience. It was preparatory to prepare him for the throne. He'd certainly learn how to treat people right. He'd certainly understand what envy can do to a person. He'd certainly learn to be kind and patient with people. He could look back and he could realize that was a gift from God. I certainly didn't enjoy it when I was going through it, but that was a gift. And yet too often, too often, when a child of God uh, goes through a hard time, goes through a crisis, we don't see it as a gift from God. Oh, no. We don't see it as a blessing in disguise. Oh, no. Matter of fact, we might even get upset at God. We might even question God. We might even wonder, where's God in all of this like Job? Like Job? <laughs> Job would lose everything that meant something to him. And though we read about the loss of his children, there is biblical truth and proof that his children will as well. Because God did double everything that Job had lost. And when we read about the children that he was able to have after his trial, we find that on earth he only had ten more children, which wouldn't have been double. So either God wasn't telling us the truth about doubling everything, or the carnal mind is not deciphering it correctly. You see, to God, those ten children that were in heaven were still alive. They never died. And so to give Job ten more was a double. Now the animals and all that for you animal lovers, don't get upset at me, but there we go. <laughs> I'm sure that's going to raise some eyebrows, but that's the Bible truth. The reality is this. Over and over throughout the scriptures, we read of people who God gave them strange gifts. Troubles even. But maybe if we were to look at it like Paul, remember God gave him a thorn in the flesh. Some physical infirmity, some physical ailment, according to 2 Corinthians 12. That, as a matter of fact, it bothered Paul so much that he prayed three times that God would remove it, and God wouldn't heal him or cure him of this thorn in the flesh. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was arthritis. I don't know if it was some eye disease. I don't know if it was a disfigurement. I don't know, but I know it bothered him. It was cumbersome. It was, it, he felt it all the time. And asked God to remove it, and God said no. But God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul would go on to say this about that thorn in the flesh. He would say, I most, I most gladly take the infirmities of my flesh, that the power of God might rest upon me. What he discovered was this. God's personal power and fellowship in closeness to me while enduring the thorn in the flesh far exceeded the pain. I enjoyed God's company to a greater degree with the thorn than I did without the thorn. I wouldn't trade anything for this condition. I most gladly deal with my infirmities now. And I know some of you out there wake up every day with physical pain. And every day you're looking for the next med to help you through it, to deal with it. But all I can say is there is a God in heaven who has grace. And I'm not saying you can't go see a doctor and all of that. I'm not saying that at all. But God does give us a wonderful example of a man who handled it and was able to look at it as a means to a greater blessing. Fanny Crosby 
became completely blind by the time she was four years old. But if it wasn't for that blindness, we wouldn't have songs like Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. We wouldn't have songs like that. I know I didn't do it any justice. We, didn't have, we wouldn't have songs like Rescue the Perishing, Care for the Dying, Snatch Them in Pity from Sin in the Grave. We wouldn't have some of the great hymn songs that we sing every Sunday and Wednesday or throughout the week if it wasn't for her going through that blindness. Joni Erickson, some of you are familiar with her. In a swimming accident, she became a quadriplegic, completely paralyzed from the neck down. Beautiful young lady, talented young lady, and yet, as a 17-year-old, she would use the ability of her limbs. And it took her some time. She wouldn't have said initially, this is a gift. But if you were to ask her today, in light of all the people who have received Christ through her testimony, in light of all the people who have received strength through her testimony, in light of all the people who have been given hope through her testimony, and in light of her own personal relationship with Christ, if you were to ask her today, what do you think about that? She'd say it was a gift. When God gives gifts, he gives them for his glory. Solomon gave this gift to Hiram not to upset him, but to do something with it. And so, we looked at the difference of perspective and we've looked at the misunderstood gift. And no doubt some people, even maybe in their physical abilities, they might have the problem, they look around and they see other people with greater abilities than they have. Maybe greater mental capacity, greater physical ability, and, and, uh, or maybe more advantages, and they look at them and then they look at themselves, and by the way, that's not wise. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. But nevertheless, people do that. Boy, they do that. And when they do that, if they don't watch it, and they get around people who are superior to them, oh, it'll bring them down. Unless, unless they look at things from God's vantage point. Unless they realize that God didn't want them to be like that other person. God wants them to be just like they are, only spiritual. God wants them to honor him in the skin that they're in. God wants them to honor him with the voice that they have. God wants them to honor him with the background that they've been given. You know, the Bible says God chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Not many noble, not many rich are called, but God just uses the ordinary, everyday people. Yeah, he chose fishermen. He didn't choose kings and princes and soldiers to get the gospels throughout the world. He chose just everyday working men. I'm just telling you right now, maybe you're at home, you're alone, and you're even a little depressed. I hate to use that word. You're depressed because maybe you feel insignificant. Maybe I'll use a psychological word. You have a low self-esteem. I wish I could encourage you for a minute. I wish I could help you see that God knows exactly who you are, where you are, what you're going through. And listen, regardless of how you feel about yourself, God has big plans for you, friend. And God wants to do something wonderful with your life. And maybe there needs to be some repairing. Maybe there needs to be some renovation. Maybe there needs to be some cleaning up. That's all right. Let God handle it. See, that leads me to the third point. The cities renewed and re renovated. Once again, 2 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 2, we find that Solomon built them 
and caused the children of Israel to dwell there. He had given them to Hiram, and Hiram looked at him and says, These mean nothing to me. Hiram gives them back. Solomon says, I'll take them. And Solomon builds them. But cleans out all the debris. Brick by brick, stone by stone, cleans out the waste. Structures begin to rise. Great edifices are there for uh, as a monument to each city. Storage and places of worship and places of commerce and places to live. And Solomon says, okay, this is open to the people of God, the children of Israel. And so the children of Israel gladly take, move into these cities. And they're inhabited. All because Solomon was able to do something with those cities. To make them inhabitable. We serve a savior who's a king. He is the king of kings. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you right now that if you'll give your heart and your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you might be a wasteland to your neighbor. You might be desolate and ruined to the people who know you well. But if you'll turn your heart and life over to Jesus Christ, there is a king who can rebuild and restore and, and put the inhabitants of praise and joy and purpose and order in your life. Though there might be chaos, if you'll turn it over to Jesus, I'm just telling you, like the maniac from Gadara, who was filled with a legion of demons, no man could bite him and no man would mess with him. But when Jesus showed up, he cleaned house. And he restored that man. And we read about him after, after all the, the disgrace of his life and how he went around naked and crazy and wild. We read about him after he meets Jesus sitting clothed in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. And I'm just telling you, friend, that's what the King of Kings will do when you turn your heart and your life over to him. He can take your little life if that's what you think it is. It, he can take you whether you live in a trailer court or an apartment complex, whether you live in a shack or a mansion. He can take your life and make something of it. Amen. I just want to challenge you. Look to him. Your outlook always affects your outlook. Look to him. And if you feel like, oh, I'm just not worthy, friend, you're exactly the person he come and died for. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God commended his love toward us in the law we were yet sinners. It doesn't say what degree of sinner. Vile sinner, perverse sinner, wicked sinner. Mild sinner. Oh, it doesn't say it's just sinner. Hey, everybody's qualified there. Sinner. And yet Christ died for you. He died for sinners. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? If he is willing to do that, you take his hand. If you don't know you're going to heaven when you die, listen, all you got to do is Ask Jesus into your heart. But then I tell you, after you do that, why not submit yourself to the King of Kings and see what he can do with your wasteland? Father, may you bless the message. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for this story in Scripture to reminds us of a greater truth. And that is the changing power of the gospel of Jesus. Help us, Lord, as we would go through troubles and trials. Help us as we look at our bad situations and realize that they may be a gift in disguise. Help us to be grateful when we're struggling, when we're lonely. Help us to lift up our voice in thanks for what you've done for us. May 
People, when they see our lives, see the inhabitants of praise and joy and gratitude. May they see order and purpose. And may they, most of all, see the handiwork of our Savior. Lord, bless our invitation. Bless this final song. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Brian. Amen. Let's all sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus in 292. decisions that would protect and promote our Christian liberties. Give them courage to make these decisions, even though the crowd that would be against them may be loud. Help them to be courageous and make the right decision. Give them uh, safety when they make these decisions. We pray that you keep your protective hand upon them. And if they won't make these decisions, if they cower or if they make decisions that bind us, we pray, Father, that you'd remove them and replace them with people who would make the right decisions. Lord, help President Donald Trump, help Mike Pence, help Connie Lawson, the Secretary of Indiana, Secretary of State, help Governor Eric Holcomb, help Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch, help Attorney General <coughs> Curtis T. Hill Jr., help Indiana State Treasurer Kelly Mitchell, 
help uh, the Supreme Court justices, John Roberts, Samuel Alito, Stephen Breyer, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Brett Kavanaugh, Sonia Sotomayor, Alina Kagan, Neil Gorsuch, Clarence Thomas. We pray, Father, for Todd Young, Mike Braun, Phil Booth, Brian Buchanan, Matt Gentry, Mike Nielsen, Chad Morgan, Scott Hood. We pray, Father, for uh, Tyson Warmoth. We pray for Ted Cruz, Rick Perry, Rand Paul, Paul Ryan, Marco Rubio, Mike Huckabee. Uh, uh, we pray, Father, for uh, the governor in Michigan. I pray that you'd help her to make the right decision, help her to do what's right. Lord, I pray, Father, for uh, some of these dear pe people that are ill. We pray for Bill Johnston. Give him grace as he's on hospice care. I pray for Deborah Charles' son, Daniel. Give him grace concerning his situation. Help Rosie Baldwin's co-workers, James McIntyre for health, and Richard Morrison for salvation. Help Lynn Campbell's neighbors. We're praying for their health. We pray for Jerry and Pearl. And Lord, once again, may you use our efforts to minister to your people and anybody who is viewing. We praise you and thank you for your goodness to us, for the help you have given us. And may you meet with us again, Lord, as we assembled again, again uh, this Sunday. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.